All right, hi, I'm back and I'm continuing with Inner Work by Robert A. Johnson. And we're continuing on through with the act of imagination. And we're on step one, the invitation. Let's get started. In mezzo del camin di nostra vita, mi ritrovai per una selva oscura. Cele diritta via era smarit. I'm just kidding, I don't even. I should have said this. So this is an excerpt from Dante's Divine Comedy and the first part is in another language and then it goes on to say, in the midpoint of this journey that is our life, I found myself passing through a dark forest, the right path through which had disappeared. And what a hard thing it is to speak of that savage forest. Again, that's from Dante's Divine Comedy. The first step in active imagination is to invite the creatures of the unconscious to come up to the surface and make contact with us. We invite the inner persons to start the dialogue. How do we make this invitation? We begin by taking our minds off the external world around us and focusing on the imagination. We direct our inner eye to a place inside us, then we wait to see who will show up. In the lines quoted above from Dante's Divine Comedy, we see how he set up the invitation. He went into his imagination and immediately found himself in a darkened forest. All the collective paths were eradicated. Quote, the right path through it had disappeared. He had to struggle through the tangled undergrowth and make his own path of discovery. There are a few great examples of active imagination in literature. The Divina Commedia is one of them. Wandering in the dark forest, Dante falls through a hole in the ground and finds himself in the inner world. He is at the threshold of Hades. He meets the poet Virgil, who, as he discovers, was sent to him by the beautiful Beatrice. Virgil guides him and talks with him as they hike through the various levels of hell. This is a classic example of how to begin active imagination. Go to a place, describe it vividly and in detail so as to get yourself anchored there, and then see whom you encounter. In Dante's case, once he connected with Virgil and began walking, he met various people. Some of them were historical figures, some were people he had been personally acquainted with before they died. With each one, he had an exchange of ideas or a clash of values. At a certain point, Virgil bows out and says that one greater than he will be Dante's guide for the rest of his journey. Then appears Beatrice, one of the great symbols of anima in all Western literature who leads Dante to purgatory and paradise. The Commedia is true active imagination. Dante tells his story in the first person. His ego lives through the entire experience, reacting, taking part in the events, dialoguing with the inner persons that he finds in his imagination. It is a spontaneous outpouring of Dante's own unconscious, mediated to us through his imagination. He deals with the great archetypal themes of loyalty and treason, virtue and evil, heaven and hell, life and death, that spring from the collective unconscious. They are common to all of us, but this was his version of the archetypal themes, his own experience of the universal leitmotifs, his own individual way of living out the evolution that each of us must make. You don't need to write a great work of literature. In fact, if you started writing for other people's eyes, it would probably distract you from living out your inner adventure, honestly. But you do need to write your own episode your own chapter in the universal Divina Commedia, that is our common human life. In order to do this, you can't copy Dante's version or someone else's. You must record what spontaneously flows through you from your own special corner of the collective unconscious. For many people, this first step, the invitation, is a little difficult at first. They sit down at the typewriter or with pen in hand and find that their minds have gone blank. If this happens, it may be that all you need is to have patience. Just wait. Keep your mind focused on your imagination, and images will usually appear before long. If not, then you need to use one of the specific techniques that follow. Sometimes it is hard to get something going. We may slam so many doors in the faces of our interior persons that when we finally get around to opening the door, 
they don't come running out to greet us. If they do, they are likely to be angry and say, Look, you who have ignored me and slammed the door in my face so many times. Sorry. Look, you have ignored me and slammed the door in my face so many times that now that I have your attention, I have a few things to say to you. But once you have invited, you have to take what comes. To invite doesn't mean to manage. Everyone who begins this art has a lot of preconceived ideas about who ought to be there and what these inner characters ought to say. People expect to hear immediately noble speeches by the Great Mother or profound wisdom from an inner guru. These things often happen, but just as often we find ourselves looking at the depression we have refused to face, the sense of loneliness, emptiness, or inferiority we've always run from. If this is what happens when you make your invitation, accept it. This negative material is the other side of your total reality. Now or later, you must dialogue with it. Jung said that it is exactly where you feel most frightened and most in pain that your greatest opportunity lies for personal growth. With these basic principles in mind, we can now look at some specific approaches you can use for making your invitation. First is waiting on alert. Perhaps the purest form of active imagination is that in which you simply clear your mind go to your imagination and wait to see who will appear. This is the approach that von Franz calls emptying the ego mind. We clear the mind of all the thoughts of the external world that simply wait and simply wait. I'll say that again. We clear our minds of all the thoughts of the external world and simply wait with an alert and attentive attitude to see who or what will appear. Sometimes this approach may require great patience and concentration. Nothing may appear for some time. What does come up may seem insignificant or unworthy to your ego mind, causing you to reject it out of hand. If you focus your mind long enough, you will usually find that some image is waiting in the wings, ready to come on stage and present itself to your attention. When this figure does appear, you should not stand in judgment. Give in to your prejudices or reject it. You shouldn't do either of those three. I read that with the wrong emphasis. So it says, when this figure does appear, you should not stand in judgment, give in to your prejudices, or reject it. It is best to assume that it has something to say that is relevant. A figure from your dream from last night may rise up, and you may find that this image wants to continue where it left off in the dream or an image may appear that you have never seen before. You may wonder who this is and why he or she has appeared in your imagination. So the simplest invitation is the most obvious. Who are you? What do you want? What do you have to say? Your dialogue begins. I have said that this is probably the, quote, purest form of active imagination because the ego has, does not choose whom you will dialogue with or what will rise up into the imagination. Your present and attitude, sorry I can't read today guys, you present an attitude of complete receptiveness to whatever appears with no preconditions or expectations attached. How to start. Many people are not suited to the method of pure receptiveness or clearing the ego mind. They find it very difficult to get their imagination launched by merely focusing the mind and waiting. They may just draw a complete blank for long periods of time. I believe that in these cases it is correct to prime the pump, that is, to do something specific and deliberate to get the flows of imagination going. We will now look at several legitimate ways that you can do this. One precaution must first be observed. Once you have found the image and started the inner dialogue, you must relinquish control. Once the invitation is made and the image appears, you can't dictate the focus of your imagination, and you can't push it in any particular direction. Number one, using your fantasies. Harnessing fantasy is a way of converting passive fantasy into active imagination. In its simplest form, you look at the fantasies that have been going through your mind today, and you choose an image, an inner person, or a situation. 
then you go to that place and that person and use it as a starting place for active imagination. Participate in the fantasy, enter into dialogue with the characters, record what is done and said, and thereby convert this passive fantasy into genuine active imagination. This approach to active imagination is especially helpful when a person has too much fantasy material. The active imagination will reduce the quantity and intensity of the fantasy by relieving the pressure from below. When you have a recurring fantasy that stays in your mind all day, it indicates that there is some inner problem that needs to be worked through. When a huge number of fantasies flood your mind, it often means that you haven't been giving enough attention to the unconscious. It compensates your imbalance toward the outer world by flooding you with fantasy, which forces you into a kind of involuntary inner life. In these situations, Jung said, you can take the subject of your fantasy and start a conscious dialogue with its images. Instead of passively watching the same fantasy repeat itself over and over in your mind, you can carry the material forward in active imagination. You establish a dialogue among the different parts of yourself that are concerned and bring the conflict to a resolution. You convert the fantasy into consciousness. Remember that fantasies are excellent divining rods. If a fantasy is running through the back of your mind today, you can safely assume that it is expressing a symbol in its symbolic form one of the main dynamics, conflicts, or areas where psychic energy is concentrated in you. If you go to that fantasy and take it as a starting point for active imagination, you will be automatically focused on an inner subject that is immediate, relevant, and important. So there are two important things you can accomplish by learning to harness passive fantasy and turn it into active imagination. First, it will help you to make your invitation when you have gone dry, when no images come up, your mind's blank, and you can't seem to get your imagination started. Second, when you find that you have a stream of fantasies that overwhelms you, it is an excellent way to focus on a fantasy, bring it up to the surface, and live it out, so to speak, consciously through active imagination. Instead of letting the stream of fantasy repeat itself wastefully or trying to act it out externally, you make it conscious on the level of where it belongs, the level of imagination. Number two, visiting symbolic places. One very simple way of making your invitation is to go to a place in your imagination and start exploring to see whom you meet there. Usually when you do this, your imagination will take you to the inner place where you need to go and connect, and connect you to the persons that you'll need to meet. This one reminds me of the um, channel Abby Normals that I told you about where she does readings with people via um, video conference or like a Skype type of deal and she relaxes her consciousness just like that. So she does the um, waiting on alert and then an image comes up and then she explores, or a, a place comes up rather, sorry. So she, like I told you about in that painting or that picture I drew, she came up with an image of the cave. And so she explored that and it ended up being very relevant because it was the caves of the person she was doing the readings on in her conscious where they were afraid to um, kind of trust and go with spirit and just kind of see what unfolds. They wanted a map in life and in everything, like literally and figuratively in the dreams, in the imagination, active imagination, they wanted a map to get through and you'll see it in another video, but you get the gist. So she was doing this, visiting a symbolic place, exploring it, and then it came up with this whole amazing story to reveal the person's unconscious blocks. Many people fall into the habit without realizing it of returning to a special place in their imagination. Remember the man who goes off on adventures with a Renaissance cavalier? Notice that he has, got, he has the custom of always returning to the same bridge in his imagination. At that bridge, the Renaissance man always comes to take him off into the inner world. For me, the seashore is a magical place that often appears in my dreams. When I don't know how to start my active imagination, I frequently go to the seashore in my mind. Uh, 
Paris. Lo siento. When I don't know how to start my active imagination, I frequently go to the seashore in my mind and start walking. Inevitably something happens or someone appears and the imagination is launched. There have been a few days when I walked and walked and almost nothing happened. Sometimes you can grow weary walking. But generally if you go to the inner place and search, you will find something waiting for you. I had a patient years ago who had a terrible time getting started in his active imagination. Nothing ever seemed to happen to him in his external life and the same dull quality carried over into his imagination. He was an absolute blank. So I told him to go to the beach as I do and start walking and looking around and see who he would meet. The next week he returned and said, yes, I walked on the beach but no one wanted to talk to me. Nothing happened. So I got mildly upset. Look, something has to happen. You walk on the beach long enough and your feet will get blisters. You'll have to go to the hospital. You'll fall in love with a nurse and get married. Something will happen. Now go do it. The following week he returned, looked at me with the same absolutely serious deadpan expression and said, the nurse wasn't any good, so I didn't marry her. But at least he got started. Your inner place may be a grove in the jungle, an Arcadian meadow with Pan looking in the lurking in the shadows, or a monastery cell. You can find the place within you where the energy is, and you can learn how to find your way back to it. Going to your inner place becomes your way of inviting the inner world. Number three, using personifications. Let us go back in our minds to the woman who was obsessed with painting her house. You may remember that she made her invitation by personifying the obsessive feelings. She looked for an image that would represent the one inside who was possessed. She started by talking to the one who seemed obsessed. At first it was like talking to the air around her. Then she heard a voice in her imagination that in turn became an image that she could see. E. What is happening here? I've been taken over by an unknown force. I can't sleep for the barrage of hues before my eyes. What are you doing here? What do you want? Who are you? Voice. This is the script that was a few chapters back. A voice says, it sounds like a, well, it sounds like a, sim a feminine voice in my imagination. And it says, she says, the colors are so lovely. See the interplay? See how they evoke different aspects of nature? These in particular go so well with the wood tones of the bookshelves. E. Excuse me. Dot dot dot. This provides you with another way of priming the pump. If you have some effect that is following you around and dogging your steps, some mood that you can't shake off, this gives you a strong hint as to where you should go to start your dialogue with the unconscious. Go to Go to the one inside you who is obsessed, depressed, or in some other mood. Go into your imagination and say, why is the one inside me who is depressed today? I don't think that makes sense. It says, why is the one inside me who is depressed today? The next question is, where are you? What do you look like? Please take some forms I can see and come up and talk with me. I want to know who you are and what you want. Number four, dialoguing with dream figures. One of the earliest uses that Jung found for active imagination was a means of extending dreams. If a dream is not resolved or you keep getting the same dream over and over again, you can extend the dream out through imagination and bring it to a resolution. This is a legitimate use of imagination since the dream and the imagination come from the same source in the unconscious. This in turn provides another way to make an invitation. One goes back to the dream and imagination and enters into dialogue with the characters there. One can pick out a specific person in the dream that one feels the need to talk with. One can speak specifically with a single dream figure or return to the situation in the dream and take up the whole encounter where the dream left off. You can effectively continue the dream 
and interact with it by extending it out into your active imagination.